Logo Centrifugal Podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logo Centrifugal. You might also be Logo Centrifugal. While you're sort of spinning that around in your head, let me do or introduce today's special guest. I have with me the man, the myth, the legend, Steel Jans, or as some of my Nordic friends might call him, Steel Jans. <laughs> Jans is a dude who I ran into on Twitter um, because he's part of, let's call it the badass sort of section of Twitter. And um, I, I like that section of Twitter because that's how I grew up. That's a lot of the people that I grew up with and I identify with a lot of the messages in there. And Jans is really good at presenting sort of a, a tough love position on a lot of things and tags into a lot of stuff. And he also chimes in anytime uh, Roman McClay says anything essentially just like the rest of us do who have read or are reading his 20 pound book. But besides that, um, I just really like his character and I like the loyalty that he has. And I like also that he he's always willing to step in and assist the things that he believes in or to speak his mind, regardless of any sort of social media consequences that might arise. And I uh, think that courage like that in that digital domain is pretty rare these days. And it's something that I appreciate a lot. And that's one of the reasons that I asked Jans to be on the show. Um, but beyond that, I really want to thank you for, coming on the podcast and welcome and why don't you tell the people a little bit more about who you are and what you do all right um well i'm changing things around i don't think it's a midlife crisis you just hit points and you got to change oh hold on and jans is having a conversation with somebody who needs some information Yes, yes, I am. There, the, I was about to say I am. I am a middle-aged father, um, and that was my just turned thirteen-year-old son asking questions. So yes, it's him and me, just the two of us. So we we do pretty good together. But yeah, teenage years is full on board. Everything's going on. Fun times. Fun, fun times. Um, but no, I'm in the middle of changing, changing jobs, changing work, changing ethics. A lot of it comes down to health, well-being, mental stability, all kinds of stuff, which I'm sure we'll get into tonight, some of it. And I'm pushing forward. And I, I like seeing other people push forward and make something and not just stand on the sideline watching. Shoulda, coulda, woulda left you a long time ago. So that's one of those things I'm I'm – working to get ahead in life again. And I gave that up for a long time and it's nice to have it back. So, I mean, that's a great, this is sort of a great place to start because, you know, I've gone through times in my life and obviously um, you've got two or three years on me here, but, um, you know, I've hit points in my life where I felt that complacency kick in and I've let myself sort of slide down from where I've been at. And to be honest, it's, for me, it's not so much of a slide as it is a, a dive because I'm pretty extreme in everything that I do. But that being said, um, I wonder what is it about your circumstances now that has sort of led you to to reevaluate your your situation and, and make make moves. Okay, one, <clears throat> everyone usually can compensate or think they you get into a rut. And the problem with getting in the rut is that path is smooth. And trying to get out of that rut is hard to do for one. And it usually takes somebody else to help you. They got to throw a rope or throw a hand, and then you have to accept it. Most people are not accepting of that. So they just continue down that smooth path. But you can hear, you can see, and you can look at everything going around you. But you have to fix yourself first. And once you start fixing yourself internally, fixing yourself physically, that starts going together. I'm real big on mind, body, and spirit. You, if one fails, the other two become weaker. If one gets too strong, the other get weaker. And you got to build it together. And once you do and it all comes together, then you can look up. You can look at the ropes that are thrown to you and the hands that are reaching down, and you grab one and pull yourself out of that rut. And then once you're up on top, you start looking around and you see what's going on 
and then that's when you really get to pick your path again. The hard part is, is when you walk right along that edge. You know, I'm kind of going, I see this path and I want to go over there, but you're walking along and then something happens, you, you get tired or whatever, and you slip back down into that rut. And I would say that would have been my last two or three years. I had a couple more circumstances, you know, a son getting older, that makes it so I have more free time, don't have to spend as much time with him. Um, work, changing, and comfortability is hard to get away from. Um, that's one of the things you mentioned, Roman, earlier. Pain demands a response. Well, if you've, if you've removed pain or numbed yourself, let's say not removed it. If you've numbed yourself from the pain, there's nothing to push you. You're freaking miserable, but you drowned it out with something. Um, and you, you fill a void, especially, and I've heard you talk about this, addicted mindsets. If you're addicted to things, you switch from one addiction to another. You never give up being addicted. You just hope that it's a better addiction than the last one. And I think a lot of people forget that. So there's good and bad addictions, and you kind of go along. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things you kind of hit on there. Even some of the imagery is pretty similar to the way I present some of the same principles. And, you know, one of the things that maybe people who haven't taken a deep dive into the world of misery don't understand is when you're in the pit you can't even see what's outside of it i mean and you can you can just like sort of look up and see that there is a world outside of your miserable existence but you don't really have any sort of connection to it or understanding of what might be out there because you're so enmeshed in that in that world that you're in of darkness and sadness and what you know whatever your thing is but you know if you're if you make the decision or you or you get the push and you start climbing out i always tell people when you climb out of the pit it makes you strong and when you emerge out of the pit i mean you can look around you exactly as you said and you go okay well i know i don't want to be evil i know i don't want to be broken i know i don't want to be miserable so what do i want and it's not immediately apparent a lot of times because you've just spent all this time trying to repair yourself and like you said especially if like a you know, it's good to have a hell to run from, but that's not enough. You also have to have a heaven to run towards. Correct. Um, but you, you kind of need both because you need to have an understanding of, well, if I, don't, if I don't do the things that I feel compelled to do or that I'm supposed to do, this is what's going to happen to me. Because if you don't have that, then you go, well, you know, maybe I'll just let this one go because what's the worst that could happen? But, you know, for a guy like me, I know what the worst that could happen is. And I... I know it so well that I could never forget it. And so I wonder maybe just to kind of give you a chance to expand upon this a little bit, where, I mean, what is, what are some of the things that called you to, to kind of step out of the rut or climb out of the rut and begin to look around because a lot of people, you know, it's comfortable and maybe it's just like a mild downhill for the last two, three decades of their life. And it's just like, well, that's what's expected of me. And I wonder why it was different for you. Okay. I actually have a point in time and you don't get too many of these, but I, I got one of these points in time. Um, and I was with my boy in scouts and uh, scouts is a rabbit hole. I, I will avoid, but it has a lot of good points, but we were going on a hike. It was a one-mile hike. We're talking light hills. It's, I live in Illinois. It's basically flat. So we're talking just little up and downs. But I had let myself go, and I was so fat that I had no exercise, no cardio, strong from work and everything, but just nothing. I got about a quarter mile into that hike, and I could no longer breathe, couldn't catch my breath, and I was having a hard time getting up this little hill. And we're talking, you know, 100 meters on a slow incline. Talk about a slow decline. This is a slow climb. I was like, go with your buddies. I got to head back to camp. I went back to camp and I sat there because I felt like, oh, I'm going to die. And that's the moment I decided, no, my boy's getting older and I got to keep up with him and I got to be ahead of him. I got to lead. I, I can't be back here all fat and out of shape. And then that's when I started fixing myself physically. 
And as I, it, I mean, I've gone on what, five years now, four or five years, I've lost track of working that weight off. I mean, I dropped it down. I went from 300 plus. I have no idea because I didn't step on a scale until I was in the 200s. But I, I took my time, took me two years, and I dropped down to about 200 something. And then I started lifting weights and putting muscle on. And just physically fixing yourself turns you around. You get that movement. You get stronger. And then that helps start clearing the mind because you're just clearing all that crap off you. You know, you're carrying all that extra weight, literally carrying weight, not just mental stuff. And then that's when you start opening your eyes a little bit. And once I did that, you know, I started lifting. You know, we hear about it. What do you want to do? Well, lose weight and get strong. It's plain and simple. You know, we say it's so easy and everyone, well, there's more to it. No, there's not. Freaking lose weight, get strong. If you're a scrawny little guy, turn around, eat freaking food and get strong. Either way, because once you do that, it starts helping out your mental. If your physical side's good, your mentality starts getting better and you start looking around to go, okay, what can I fix here? Or what can I do there? Or what do I clean up my mind? You know, and it was probably, I would say, eight months, eight, nine months after I got into my physical and started losing weight, uh, the next thing that I cut out was gaming. And when mm. I played MMOs, my last one was Guild Wars 2. I started off it with City of Heroes in 2004, and I've been playing online games from then till, what, 2015, I think. And when I say I gamed, it, uh, a short week for me was 40 hours. Dang. I, w I would game more than I would put in at work. An average week for me was anywhere from 60 to 70 hours, if you included the weekend, that I gamed. Digital space, all my accomplishments were with fingers, jumping, whatever. I, I conquered games. What did that get me? absolutely nothing really at the end of the day help me get fat you know it was cheap i'd go play the freebie versions but you always are paying for something you're always shelling out a little here they still get their money out of you it's a joke but you have that mental dopamine rush well i quit gaming i went back to reading books you know a little bit online um got involved in twitter <laughs> which has been entertaining <laughs> Um, and a side note, we'll throw a side note in here on Twitter. If anyone is a gamer, full on, full fledged MMO, I can't tell you about Xbox cause I can't work the thumbs to play Xbox <laughs> PlayStation. That is not me. I got to have a keyboard, but if you have not realized it yet, why so many people are addicted to, um, Twitter is because it's the same at, at its base, at its root. It's the same basis as chat is in a game. And if you play MMOs, part of the reason you're playing that is part of the community because you want to talk to people and have chat and you do stuff together. Twitter is the adult version. It's, it's the, you know, game of life and it's the chat box for it. Hmm. And people have not, I have mentioned that to some and they're like, huh? Well, if you've never played an MMO, you wouldn't understand. But if you have and you've done community, been part of large guilds, part large groups, you will realize that's all Twitter is with a couple extra bells and whistles. It's just a gaming chat room. That's interesting. You know, I will say this in defense of games. Um, there is built into the gaming paradigm the idea that there are paradigmatic levels of ascension you know i i played a lot of games growing up i mean my dad bought the nes the year it came out which was the year i was born in 85 and i, I always had it and i and then i had the super nintendo and i had the nintendo 64 and you know i kind of i went along and i have a playstation 4 right now and it's funny for me because i'm very much into rpgs as my main game thing and every once in a while, I'll have two to three weeks where I'm like, you know, I want to play a video game and I'll go, you know, I'll go find a game or whatever and I'll sit down and play it. And I'm like, cool, this is a cool RPG. And I wonder if it's going to be the one finally that I really, really connect with 
And then I'll get, you know, I'll get maybe a week in, two weeks in, three weeks in. I'm like, man, to hell with this. It stopped being satisfying. The story's corny. The character advancement just kind of burned out. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm good. And I haven't, you know, I haven't finished a game since I was probably 15 because it's just like, it's, it's not, it's not quite there. And, but I will say that that idea, and you know, I'm from Utah and I grew up in the Mormon church and the Mormon church is very much about there's levels and there are gatekeepers and there are keys to the, to the leveling up. And so it's very easy for a Mormon to, to, Absolutely. get involved in RPGs because of that same thing. But I appreciate that about the games, but I will echo your sentiments that there is a very slippery slope with those kinds of things where if you start to substitute your friendships and your actual development and you know, your, your precious time is devoted solely or, or in large part to the gaming situation, boy, you sure miss out on a lot of opportunities to actually level up your life rather than your avatar. And that's a, that's a pretty dangerous thing. Um, but that being said, man, um, <clears throat> I really well, like your comparison to the, to the chat room uh, and the community around the game situation for Twitter, because that, that as soon as I heard you say that, I thought, yeah, that's, that's about right. Yep. And, and I totally agree with you on that. It's like m my boy has an Xbox. He knows how to, how to, you know, he wants to learn how to do stuff. He has to look on YouTube to figure it out. One, I am not going to learn, but two, he, it's a training tool. The other thing that a lot of people forget, and it's a balancing act, and I am blessed. He self-regulates himself. If it's nice outside, he goes outside and plays. He'll set it down in a heartbeat because he plays it too much. Now, when it's extremely cold, extremely hot, and the weather's nasty, he's got something he can tinker with and he's good or he'll do whatever on it. The thing is, it's like anything. It has to have moderation and that'll probably come up and go, I'm, I'm huge on moderation. If you tell someone you can't have it, when they grow up, they're going to have it. You know, my parents didn't allow me to have guns in the house, period. There were none. What did I do when I got out of the house? I have an armory, you know, <laughs> It's, it's, it's those kind of things. So, but when you're a kid, my goal is, is to show them that how much life is better than that game. I did not game when I was a kid. We didn't have gaming systems. My brothers had gaming systems. I was kept away from them. I, I think, I don't know, 17, 18, they finally got a Nintendo in the house and I tinkered Mario Brothers. The first like Mario Brothers. I remember playing that when I went home, I, but so I didn't have it. So when I got to games with an addictive personality, uh, it hit me even harder than it should have. And that's why I go. So you have to be careful, but I had, I, I was smart enough and we're working kind of around the thing of physically working on my mental thing. I knew I had to quit gaming, but when I quit the gaming and that, this is a personal thing. When I quit that gaming, there was going to be a void. And there's the other thing is you have to recognize that there's a void. Next thing is, what are you going to fill that void with? It has to be purposeful. It has to have a level up aspect and it has to have something. And I think to a certain extent, that's what eventually drew me to Twitter. Um, actually, we'll name drop here. And, and I hardly read anything anymore. It's kind of funny. But Goldman Unleashed. He said, join my Twitter to follow something. And I'm like, you know, I've had Twitter for a year and I'm not done. He was the first person I hopped on and followed on Twitter and got everything working. Mm -hmm. And then from there on out, I just started meeting everybody else. But somewhere along the line, I went, oh, well, this is my gaming chat room. And Twitter, as dumb as it is, has helped me not go back to gaming because I've had that chat room. If I'm bored, I'll just go on there. You know, I'll, I'll stir the pot a little bit or I'll read some stuff or whatever, but it's freaking gaming. It's just a game of life. So it fits. It works. So, yeah. Um, but going back to kids, I think you know, kids should have a certain amount of game. Should you regulate it? Yeah. I see no problem with that. Regulate it for a time, but let them play that thing because if they did, then it's just normal. Um, I, I set stuff up like 
my boy wanted a little motorbike. We got him a motorbike. You know, does he ride it much anymore? No. Every once in a while, though, he can go out, he can start it, he can run the thing. He's got basketball and football, and we play catch. We go fishing. We go out and hike. You know, life is more interesting than freaking digital pixels. And there, there's the key. The people that just throw their kids a tablet are losing out. You got to go do stuff and be active in their life. And that's kind of back to my point in time where I couldn't make that hike. I thought I was doing stuff with him, but in reality, no, I wasn't. I wasn't engaged with him. I was around him, but I wasn't engaged with him. So that's a definitely change point. You know, my, my entrance into Twitter is sort of from the opposite angle because I have a pretty dark past to be frank. I mean, I've talked about it a lot and I'm sure people are just like, all right, chance. Cool. We heard it, but (laughs) the, the angle is just that I'm naturally pretty asocial. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of friends and that's on purpose. I, I don't do a lot of social events and that's also on purpose because number one, coming from where I came from and then realizing who I was, I knew I needed to remove myself from who I was already with. And I also knew that I wasn't the kind of person that really ought to be around good people because I have a very influential personality and um, I wasn't a great dude and I needed some time to rectify that. Uh, and it took a long time, man. You know, I, you know, if you if you live half your life being a shithead, it doesn't it just like, yeah. It's not like you, tomorrow you're cool and it. But you know, I finally felt like okay, you know, I've I put in the work, and and don't get me wrong, by no means am I a perfect guy, but I'm a good man, and I know that I'm a right. good man. I know the difference, and I and I thought, I've I've come a long ways, and I have a lot to offer, and I want to offer it. I want to be able to do this. And I have found since joining Twitter and doing this podcast and things like this, it's filling in some of the gaps that uh, were obviously in my life. You know, I, I've made connections. And in fact, it turns out I have a, a knack for connecting people with me, but with also with other people. And, and also I've had all these conversations and I have really learned how to listen to other people and just be a lot more receptive and, and open-minded to the people who I've welcomed into my life and I'm still pretty I still have a pretty like strong barrier to the people that I don't want in there but I'm very even my wife the other day you know I've had a little bit of difficulty balancing how much time I really ought to spend doing these kinds of things because I'd never done it before you know since my space and that was when I was 19 I didn't give a shit about anything anyway but you know the other day I was talking to my wife and I and I listened very intently and then I kept my calm when we had a disagreement and then we sort of worked through it. And, and I was like, look, I really have learned how to listen to you so much better because I've had all these conversations with people and I'm learning how to do this, even though I, you know, developmentally, maybe I'm not that way. I'm learning how to do it. And she thought, yeah, you know, I guess you really are. And I'm really grateful to Twitter because, you know, I've had, I've had some financial benefits from Twitter and I've had a lot of friendships develop and a lot of opportunities come my way. And, And that's one of those things where Twitter sort of splits from maybe just like a a video game community or something. It's like, Oh, these are absolutely do something. And if you, if you can offer them value, they'll, they'll pay you for it and you can help them. Well, but I'm going to go that still goes back to the online community or onto the gaming community. Look at it this way. You're sitting in a game and what do you do? If you join a guild, you meet friends. They're online friends, but you meet those guys. They help each other. Everybody will do things you need. Say you want the, you know, the golden sword of Sartreuse or something, you know? You get 10 guys to go, yeah, we're not doing nothing tonight. Let's go fight the dragon and get it. Well, Twitter does the same thing, but the big difference is it's fucking real life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's the, there's the thing. Oh, I want to write a book and put it on Gumroad. Three guys will go, okay, you need to do this. You know, oh, I, I want to go make, I want to make, uh, you know, say what? You want to make $1,000 online this month. You'll have 10 guys go, all right, I'll help you. What do you need? 
oh, you need a little digital graph or whatever? Yeah, I was thinking this, and this wasn't. Oh, let me help you out. I can do this. You exchange this, throw this. It's the same thing. It's just it's it's real life. We've we've taken our gaming knowledge, in in hiding behind K our keyboards and a non because you know if you're in the gaming you don't tell anyone your real name. Period. You know that's real bad. So you're bringing it to real life and you are bringing a real thing and you're doing something and we're playing the game of life because that's how it is. It's building connections. Twitter is awesome for that. And at some point, you knew I was going to probably talk about the fraternity, the um, fraternity of excellence. It brought me to them. Um, I've had an interesting history with uh, Hunter that was in a podcast. I'll leave it there. And, um, but uh, they've grown and I've come. I found my tribe, you know, and the fraternity has gotten for it. I'm watching other tribes being grown and I've had offers to join them. And I look at them and, and you have to be careful because if you join too many tribes, you get pulled too many directions. And again, you just kind of, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, I've turned stuff down or I look and go, oh, that's really cool. I want to hang out with them, but I don't need a new shiny ball. So I'm 100% with the fraternity. And um, that's a big deal. And you know, my brothers helped me out. Uh, I hit a shit storm today, reached out took care of me you know it's like all right let me ask you some questions da, da 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 did it really fucking matter no you know a dumbass email threw me in a tailspin while i was busy trying to get some other stuff accomplished and at the end of the day it's all going to work out i know it's going to work out but for three hours of my day i'm trying to fix something and i'm like mother mm. you know and you have those moments and you need those tribe members and you're finding them um you're finding your tribe, you know, yeah, and, and, and yeah. that's where Twitter wins because we're getting to meet these like-minded people across the freaking world. Because if we had tribes, all of us, I, and, and I can totally get where you're coming from. If you, if you had that tribe locally, you wouldn't be online right now. The problem is, is you can't find that tribe locally. So what do you do? You went to online. And then online, you realized, oh, there's like-minded guys. There's guys that can help me or work with me or whatever. And then the next thing you know, you're growing into it. And you're like, okay. And then my thing is the next step. I, I love Zoom. I think Zoom is awesome. You get to look at people and we can see smiles and reflections and you get that extra piece in it. But it's still digital pixels. You know, I can't reach out and shake your hand. It's still a digital thing. And one of my big things, and this was my get-go from all the way when I started and I joined the fraternity, was started to work to real life meetups. And at the time, and I mean, I'm going on, I don't know, nine months, 10, I, I've lost track. But I do know that in the first uh, four months of me joining, I went from knowing no like-minded men to shaking hands with, let's see, three, four, five. Five men in a period of few months. I just boom. You know, I'm talking to people across Twitter. It's like, okay, if we can hook up, I will. I'm not scared. You know, it's like people are jumpy. It's like, I don't know if I want to meet them. You know, I don't know if I want to. Okay, you meet new people every day. You walk into a bar in a different town. With a hundred different people, and you may or may not talk to somebody, but yet you chat to someone on Twitter for freaking, you know, months, maybe exchange pictures, see them on a podcast or everything, but you're afraid to afraid to shake hands and have a drink with them. There's no justification for that. It's like, okay, why are you such a coward? Because you're meeting somebody from online and you look at them and you're like, yeah, let's hook up. Um, <laughs> If people don't think that way, you know, you go meet to, or what do you do in life? Oh, I'm a salesman for XYZ company. All right. But you, you'll go out and meet new people every day trying to sell something. But someone that you've been chatting with for six months, you're scared to shake hands with. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Whatever floats your boat, you know, and, and, and I'm working past that point. It's like, let's meet up, you know? There was, and I remember this, 
I want to say it was Scott Baker. And if he hears this, he probably could correct me. But there was another kid talking about, hey, I would like to do real life meetups. Uh, there's nobody close. I don't know. And I believe he bounced up and he started talking. Come to find out they're like 20 minutes from each other. Hmm. You're literally, you're both talking online and in with almost spitting distance of each other. Well, if you want to meet a real person on Twitter and go beyond the digital barrier, reach out to people. Um, just recently, I had someone, we didn't get it to work out, but he was like, hey, I'm, I'm headed that direction. Can we meet? You know, possibly. And we tried to work it out. Things fell through on this go around, but there'll be another time. I'm, I'll be headed that way or something. And, and I think that's where a lot of guys on Twitter, um, in the different uh, groups, the different tribes that are building, you got to get past this medium. This is where we meet. This is sending that letter out there. You know, think back before the digital age. What'd you do? You had to travel. Now you can figure, you know, you talk to someone online. If you are nervous on them, fire up a Zoom. You know, you one-on-one, -on -one, it can be free. Fire up a Zoom, get it going, and then talk with them. You know, get a little bit more. But I'm getting to meet people all over the world. If I want to go someplace, um, I, I have a friend in Ireland. I'm talking about going there. He's like, well, hit Dublin, and then you can do da-da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, awesome. That's exactly what I'm looking for. You just took hours of me doing research, trying to figure something out. And I even kicked him a couple ideas. He's like, oh, but your boy likes fishing, right? Yeah. Well, did you know you can rent a boat and it'll take you around the locks and you can stay on it? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'd have never found that, but that's, that's what you get for meeting. Um, well, and you've had him on here, Fury. Next time I'm in the Netherlands, I'm going to be staying. <laughs> Next time I pass through the Netherlands – and he, he can hear this and laugh, but I'm going to set it up where I stay like a couple of days. We are hooking up. Um, James, I, I want you to know, anytime you're in the Netherlands, you should come, come see me. We'll do a quadka. We'll hook up with Niels. We'll, <laughs> we'll all do quadkas, quad times, 16, 16 sets of vodka, the 16 cut. <laughs> exactly. Well, see, I was bummed my last trip through there. It was too short. I, 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 I'm learning. I'm learning how to travel. That's another thing. Got to learn how to travel. There we go. Yeah, you're you're hearing me getting into rant mode. That that's a common joke if um, among the fraternity. I I do get into my rant, so it's good. You know, I have a side piece to my podcast called Chance Rants, and it's just an opportunity for me to ramble on about whatever the fuck I want to talk about, and that, that's fine. And I, you know, I agree with you. I have I have had podcasts with people in Africa, in Europe, in you you know North America, in South America, and it's it's so cool. And I I told my wife the other day as you know it's like look, basically anywhere in the world that you would want to go, I have more than one friend there, and and I, and I mean friend like I've known them for months, and we've had lots of back and forth, and maybe we even had a podcast together, and I I know who they are. I've tested them i've shit tested them i've inquired about them i've seen their home you know like pictures of their homes and, and even sometimes pictures of their families and stuff and it's you know if i go if i go to the uk you know i could go to ireland and scotland and england and all over the place and, and or you know i could go to spain it's and it's so cool because even just having access to people who live in these places and really getting the straight dope on on how life is there and what it's all about you know you get a news story or whatever and then you go, hey, you know, like Benjamin in in Spain, what is this really about? Oh, uh, yeah. never, never mind. And for some reason, I have a British accent, but I like to tell <laughs> Spanish people I'm British and British people I'm Spanish. But I'll tell you the straight shit because <laughs> you're me pal. That's a terrible Benjamin George impression, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but so. you know, it's it's cool. And and to the to the point about building tribes, you know. Number one, Hunter's a great dude, and I've connected with him, and, and he was not really sure about me. Hunter has gotten pretty good at vetting people. Yes. And a lot of people, a lot of people look at me, and they're like, what? what is this dude about? I don't know. <laughs> but Hunter's a good dude. But, you know, I have this podcast group, 
and I'm, I'm slowly transitioning it off of Twitter because I ran out of room in that podcast group. But, you know, so many people in there say, this is such a special place because we're all from different walks of life, different industries, different beliefs even, but we're able to come here and just support each other and laugh and have a good time. And it's interesting all the time because, you know, here's Alexander Cortez over here saying something. And then, you know, here's Nick Lowry over here saying something. And then here's Tanai Rick saying something, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody's kind of got their angle and we all kind of get a richer understanding of what it is to be online, what it is to be human and the different, you know, sort of expressions of life all around the world and it's it's so fascinating and i wonder from from your perspective and you know and having some of these opportunities to meet up with people and to travel and know that you can connect with people in these different places what does it does it lead you to want to travel more and and kind of what does it mean to you to be able to have access to all these things because i kind of talked about how it, I, you know i i really like to look at stuff underneath the surface and I don't always let people into that. I try to, you know, I, I wrote a tweet the other day. If you, you know, pretend to be the dumbest person in the room and you'll learn. Yes. And that really resonated with a lot of people. But I try to do that on this podcast often, too. And often that's because I'm talking with somebody who's a super genius and I just really want to know what they know. But it's also. If I pretend to be super smart or even if I am super smart on a subject, it's better for me to, to ask. And, and so I wonder, you know, what does it what does it mean to you and, and what does it mean for your future to know that you have all these connections and you can go to these places and connect? Okay. It's kind of interesting. When I was younger, we'll go twenties. In my twenties, I was very nomadic. Hmm. Um, even, even as a youth, my, my dad traveled a lot. Um, I was constantly in motion. Uh, there was a running joke that when I was 16, I had moved 16 times. So, background a little bit my dad was a minister and to make ends meet he would be he was a salesman so that's what he did small churches you know not any of the big huge mongus he went and worked with small churches and everything and then he was uh he was also a missionary and an evangelist and stuff so i have that upbringing with all my other thoughts and ideas but there was a lot of travel then there was a little bit of st stability and we stay, he stayed put for a while and raised my brothers and stuff. And um, when I hit 18, I left the house. I was out within days and, of graduating. And from that point to my late 20s, I traveled a lot, extensively. Uh, I even was a truck driver for a while. I'm, I'm down to I just need Maine, Alaska, and Hawaii. And all of, I'm, that's all I need left for states. I, I have seen most of all the major, I don't know, attractions in the, in the U S name one. I have probably been there. You name fancy lakes, name, whatever. I've probably been there. I may have just visited, maybe in there a day or two, but it's like, you know, it's like I, I took a trip up to Mount Rushmore just cause I wanted to see it boring as fuck. I, I, <laughs> I, I got there and I'm like, okay, it's big rock with faces did nothing for me but then it's like i go to niagara falls i didn't want to leave i could probably camp out at the bottom of niagara falls until it became winter it's just such a powerful place and but you have to explore and i did that and then in my late 20s i felt like i needed to settle down i let society's mindset at the time wrap me in got married da 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 da, da had kid and everything and in in that time frame was a very, let's say, hectic. Lots of turmoil, good and bad, a lot of growing to do. But I became stagnant. I became stuck. Uh, I got out of it. I joined the military when I was 29. Hmm. So I went in with 29, did my time, did a, did a stint overseas. And... So I got out in my mid thirties and then I went back to my, my normal wrenching and everything. And still I was, I was stagnant. And then recently I would say in the last couple of years, one physically I'm doing better two mentally getting better. And this kind of leads into, and I didn't talk about it yet is, is the spiritual side of things, your spirit. You have to build that up and you don't realize how broke it was. Mine was my first trip out of the country. 
When I got out of the freaking United States, I realized how broke I was in that. I thought I was doing good, but I got to see other people's perspectives and got to hear other people talk. And it's interesting when you get to look at, you know, just like this, you get to hear someone else's viewpoint. That really got my brain working. And then it's like, I started traveling more. I, you know, I joined a tribe, the Fraternity of Excellence. I started doing real life meetups. I started moving. I started going places and I'm back to being nomadic, wanting to be nomadic like I was in my 20s. Now, I've built a good community and a stable place for my son. So currently, I'm stuck, but I'm working within those parameters. I can't just take off like I want to, you know, sell the house, sell the car and be gone. That would be wonderful. I even tell him that, but he's like, someday, and I'm like, you're right. Someday we will, you know, but we travel together, um, taking him places. He's at the age where he can absorb information and actually enjoy stuff. Mm-hmm. So not this summer, last summer? Has it been a year? Yeah. Um, I actually found out I had some family close out to LAX that I hadn't seen in a long time. So took my boy. We flew out to California, spent a week out there, hit the beaches up in Venice and um, Santa Monica and all of that. And then we ended up taking Amtrak back. In hindsight, we should have did it in reverse because 70 hours on a train is a really long time. But we went exploring, and he likes exploring, so we're doing that. Uh, took a trip out to Denver. Or we go up to Michigan. We've been down to North Carolina. So I'm starting to show him stuff that I had seen already and that I think is important for him to experience and we're working our way through it. Probably one summer, I've swam in all five Great Lakes. My goal is to get it so he can swim in all five Great Lakes. You know, he's in the age, so I'm getting it. And then if he wants to settle down, he's a very extroverted person. So I, I'm guessing he'll end up in a city someday, and he'll love it because he just he does. But I'm showing them that there's more out there. You know, there's – I live in a place where he can ride his bicycle up and down the street and I don't have to worry about it. I got neighbors that watch and if he's doing something bad, they yell at him. So it's perfect. Right. So that part's good. So when you built that community and in the village up and you know, the village raised the kid, I have that. So I have a nice strong spot. You can't just give that up and throw it willy nilly because I want to go travel. And I think that's where maturity comes in. In my twenties, I'd have been like, Oh, I'm moving. We're now in my 40s. I'm like, oh, okay, let's think this out and balance the two worlds. So I've always been nomadic. Um, I became stagnant in life, and that made it so I could sit in one place. But when I started to wake back up and, and get going again, it's like, oh, I'm stuck. I hate owning a house. I think it's one of the worst things there is. The only reason to own a house is if you're renting it to somebody else to make money off of it. Other than that, it's a money pit. There is no value in it. Unless you got it real cheap and fixed it up or whatever, a person's house is a freaking money pit. And they don't think that, you you know, here I am. Now I am ranting. We'll rant on houses for a moment. <laughs> I think this is something that people don't realize. You buy a house and you have some grass and you got whatever. Okay. You even got a good deal on it. Say you got it at 50% of what it's worth. Say, say it's a $100,000 house and you bought it at 50000 So when you sell it, you're going to make fifty grand, right? Give or take. We're, we're rounded numbers. What people don't realize is if, when the furnace goes out, you're the one replacing it. When any appliance goes out, you're the one replacing it. If the roof is going bad, you got to replace it. And none of these items are uh, heating and air conditioning, ten grand. A roof is ten, twenty grand, easy, depending on what it is. Windows. So you do this general, oh, I'm just taking care of general maintenance. Okay, I get that. But then take a step back from that. That's the major stuff. You either have to pay someone to mow your grass, or you got to go buy a lawnmower. You got to put gas into it. You got to put time into it. And you got to put all this energy into the yard and everything. Now, granted, you're raising a kid. It's nice. I got dogs. I got big dogs. It's good because I don't have to deal with any rules or regulations on that. Okay. 
but you're paying for those luxuries. It's not an investment. You're paying for luxury. It could be that simple. And if you really add up what a house costs you, you're losing money. You know, I have a buddy that lives downtown Chicago. Yeah, his apartment's expensive and everything else, but he has no lawnmower, doesn't pay for gas. He doesn't have to roof his house. If the furnace goes out, he calls somebody. Who's really ahead at the end of the day? You know, say he, you know, he bought the place. I think it's a condo. Say he bought it for 100000 When he leaves, he can sell it for 100000 He didn't have all the extra draining on him to take it out. And, and I think we'll go back, we'll play the old back in the day when everyone was buying a house. Yeah, it was cheap enough and our dollar went farther. And it would be an investment over a long period of time of 30 years. But look at the guys nowadays, contractors who flip jobs every six months to a year and a half. You're not building up investment. If you go buy a house, sell it, and then go buy another house, you're losing money. You, you're you not gaining. I don't, yeah, or you go, there's, there's the one-offs. There's one in a million that are making money. But for the average person, they're not. Unless you're building, you know, you buy a house for your kids. So if you're an old farming community and, you know, great grandpa bought the house, paid it off, now the kids are working off of it. Okay, then there's a reason to own a house. But if you just go out and purchase one on your own, yeah, no, especially if you're single. I think it's one of the worst investments. I don't even consider it an investment. And I'm sure there's gurus out there that will tell me how wrong I am. And I will tell them that, it looks good on paper, but it doesn't really work that way because all the other add-ons that no one tracks. No one tracks the $10 for, you know, the piece of siding coming off or hiring someone because the gutter fell down to tack it back up. Most people don't track that stuff, so they don't think about all those numbers. There's, there's my rant on houses. I, I'm not a fan of them, owning them anyway. I'm going to I'm going to push back on some of this stuff a little bit uh, because Absolutely. Because number 1, I am not a nomad at all. I think Utah is the greatest fucking place on the planet and I never want to live anywhere else. I want to go other places, but I love Utah. I always tell people it has everything that any other place has besides a rainforest and the ocean and those are half a day's drive away and it has things that there's nothing like it anywhere else on the planet. You can go to southern Utah, there's nothing like it anywhere anywhere and there's the uintas and anybody who's ever hiked in the uintas understands that that is quite literally magically spiritual place in fact the navajos believe that god the physical body of god lives within the mountains of the uintas and you know i've I've had some experiences it's probable probable. (laughs) i'll go with it i've been (laughs) through there i haven't had big hikes but i'll go it's probable so, so from, from that sort of perspective and also, you know, my dad's family, um, on both his father and his mother's side were pioneers who came here and settled this place. I have deep as, as deep as roots go in this place. And I, I love it. I love being here. I'm always telling people move to Utah. It's the best place in the world without question. And they, Oh, well, what about, Nope, it's the best. You can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> and you know, I do. Yeah, it, it is because, because I live here and I love it, you know, and I, and I, and I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else, but you know, I, I've, I've done some traveling for work and things when I was younger and uh, you know, I hated California. It's like, this would be a really nice place except for everybody who lives here. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, but, but that being said, um, I think also a lot, like a lot of what you talked about, let's, let's take the, the lawn for example. There's a, there's a de- design philosophy that I became interested in because I got really into gardening quite early. My grandpa was a farmer. His father was a farmer and my dad moved away from it, but he still keeps a garden and everything. And I love to garden and I sure. got really into this design philosophy called permaculture. And it basically started out as how can we design a permanent system of agriculture that will be, that will, that will give more than you put into it. 
And from that perspective, what it eventually became is here's a design system that could be applied to anything. If it's your job, if it's your personal life, if it's your garden, if it's anything, and it's sort of, okay, let's stack functions. Let's keep the most important things closest to the place where you're most often going to be. How can we get the most return on our effort? And how can we increase that exponentially over time? And so for me, like, let's say I have a house. I, I rent the house that I'm in right now. I'm in a house, I have a yard, uh, and I can do whatever I want with the yard, but I'm on the hook for repairs. So it's basically like I own it, except I don't. And rent's not, rent's not bad or anything, but I have, I'm on a fifth of an acre and 70% of that is gardening space. And I have tons of berries and I have squash and beans and tomatoes and peppers and salads. And, and does it, does it like compensate for the fact that I'm paying this rent? No, but I have better food that I could get anywhere else. I would say it does. I would actually say it does compensate for it. So I think that's a good thing because you're making use of the land. Sure. And my, and my point, my only point with this is, it's sort of all in, in how you make it work for you. If you do live the traditional American household life where it's the, it's the lawn and it's the two cars and it's, and it's the boat and it's the four wheelers. Look, I'm not throwing shade on anybody, but a lawn is so dumb. Why would you have a lawn? What's, I mean, you know, I have a lawn in my front yard and I was using a push mower for the first six years I lived here. And I went out and bought an electric mower recently. And I thought this electric motor is, or mower is a hundred dollars more than a regular mower. But I, the battery lasts long enough that I can mow my full front lawn and I never have to put oil or gas or anything in it. And, and it, and it works great. It actually, it works damn good. It works, it works the far sight better than that goddamn push mower. <laughs> I don't tell you that much. Well, and, see, but you improved, but, but there's the thing you're thinking that way. How can I fix things? How can I go about and make it work? You know, I wanted a yard mainly. So my boy had an area to play. The dogs had an area to run. My yard looks like hell. I keep it mowed, you know, but still you're, you're building the gardener. I am not a gardener. You know, it's one of those deals. Even though I live in a cornfield, I have a spit and distance from cornfields. I live in a subdivision that's surrounded by cornfields. My yard is old cornfield. But the thing of it, when you look at it though, is you're making use of your ground, so you're getting something in return. Those vegetables are better than whatever you can buy in a store anywhere. Absolutely. You know, and th that's the good. But then turn around and look at all your neighbors. How many of them are doing the same? You, you would be all of them all actually. Of them? Well, I that live in place. <laughs> See, it's not like that awesome. anywhere, even in, even in Utah. But you know. The second, the second prophet of the Mormon church was a guy named Brigham Young, and he was a badass dude. He, he, you know, they sort of whitewashed the history, but he was a hardcore dude. But one of the things he said, and it's one of the favorite things I've ever heard from a religious leader, he said, if you own land and you don't grow food on it, I think you should be excommunicated from this church. And, but, you know, there, this, this place was, they came here. And, they, and Brigham Young looked around and it was just this god awful desert. And he said, this is the place. And, and he, you know, but it was just this like god awful desert. And the reason they settled here is because, well, nobody's going to want to follow us here. This is, this is just this desert, but it had this, these mountain valleys and, you know, there was snowpack in the mountains and there was some lakes and stuff here and there. And through a lot of hard work and a lot of clever people and needing to make it work, they, they set up irrigation systems and they built these grid streets and all the communities here made sense initially and that's starting to get railroaded but i want to i want to kind of steer it a little bit back to back to the permaculture thing because i have this dream it's part of my grand vision and what i would really love to do and i want to do it for myself first i want to own you know i want to be the like the landlord of a place but i want to buy a whole bunch of property and in that property i want to have a food forest tons of perennial fruit trees and fruit bushes and, and annual gardens and livestock and all these things but set up in a way like you can okay let's say you have an angle on your land right 
if it rains, all the water just runs off and it actually takes the land away. Right. Okay, but what if you put a ditch on contour called a swale? Yep. Well, now you have a water harvesting thing that will infiltrate the water and now it stays moist for longer and you can plant trees just beneath that swale and they will stay moisturized without any irrigation for much longer. And then over time, it'll become even more robust. Okay, so we put the food forest in and we put a bed and breakfast in and we put an amphitheater in and we put a, a place where shops are in place where people can do metal work and woodwork and glass work and then we put you know apartments for people who don't want to own a house and then we build nice homes that fit within the land and they have access to all these things anyway and there's paths and there's beauty too there's flowers there's benches there's paths and i build this giant community not, not giant but reasonable and everybody who lives there can work there and then people come there because there's cool stuff being made there's art there's food there's classes and then once i build that place i know it will work because the principles behind it are solid and they've been tested all over the world and i'm just trying to combine some more of these things because you you know if you have an amphitheater and entertainment and stuff okay etc so i build that place and then i want to just make them all over the place and i want to teach other people how to make them and then i I want to go as far with that as I can so that, you know, like you, you don't think going in a house is a good idea. And okay. For a lot no, of no. All right. But we'll, we'll, let's add a thing in there. Not that a house is a, not a good idea, but it's not an asset. Unless it's, it was a community like that. Right? Yes, because exactly. Provides, yes. If you're working to what you're saying, now you're changing the paradigm on it. But let's talk, <laughs> if you talk the normal house, if it's not making you money, it's not an asset, it's a deficit. And that's what I'm getting at, is it's a deficit. What you're describing is what everybody should be shooting for. Everyone's helping and working out. I think that's awesome. Now, I want to add something in. in there's two things I want to add to this. One. My next door neighbor and actually does daycare for my boy when he was younger is like a grandma to my kid. Love her to death. She's lived in this neighborhood all her entire life. Never moved anywhere else. Like she literally lives what? Three miles away from where she grew up. Hmm. So she moved one house over type thing. Or, you know, one, one thing. She knows everybody in the community. And when you walk into her house, she has her great grandmother's like china on the wall. She has stuff from the last 70 years laid out, and there's a story. And her husband collects all kinds of things, and it's all up on shelves around the room and everything else. And you can go in there, and I can sit in there, and I love to chat with her because it's peaceful. Hmm. It's a stationary place that has been built and created for, you know, a good. You can just walk in and you're like, you could be set at peace because it has the history. It has the roots. But you're talking to a person that has no roots. I have never had roots. So, hence, I'm a nomadic person. Now, here's the thing. You're wanting to build roots. I 100% agree with that. I think that's awesome because that's going because nomadic people need guys that have roots. We got to be able to go to the places to have a peace and relax and take a step back from war and wandering and anything else. You got to have those oasis. You got to have those places. And on the opposite side, you need nomads. Absolutely. Because if you don't have a nomad, you don't know where you're going to go build the next place. You're not going to hear about, you know, Say I'm you're in Utah and I'm passing through. Let, let's just keep it close. Say I'm passing through Louisiana and I'm sitting talking to a guy that's talking about wanting to build what you have, but he doesn't know what to do. He's a young kid. He doesn't know what to do, but he sees it. He kind of wants to know, and I can go, oh, I know someone. Come meet Chance. Come walk with me. You need the nomads to bring them in, and then you can find the other people that have the fire to do the same thing because that's really what you're looking for you can't go out and build different places everywhere because you're building your own you can go assist them 
you can go help them, but you're not going to leave Utah to go build another place in freaking Louisiana. You'll go there and assist. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But if they come back, you know, think about the big corporations or anybody else. They make a flagship, and then they have everyone come in and see the flagship, and then they go back out. So I need places like you're talking about to go rest and relax. You need nomads to find the other places where you need to go help. So we help each other out. That's that's a good thing, you know, and, and I'm a nomadic person. The problem is, is I tried to shut that part of my life off, and I became miserable. I'm a nomad. I want to be a nomad. I'll be nomadic. Um, I'm setting my life up so I can travel and do stuff. It's just I've gone from the United States to the freaking world. It, what's funny on that, though, is I don't like backpackers. <laughs> <laughs> the backpacking community, someone will probably hear this and go, why is he saying that? I, 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 they don't have enough class for me. I mean, I, I don't think they, 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 they fumble through other places. With their own mentality instead of going there. They kind of remember the British. The British will come in, they freaking plant the flag and say, now you're all Brits. Where the French kind of came into Canada and stuff and went, oh, let's integrate with the Indians. You know, you know if you look at the American history, that, that's kind of it is. The, what became America, what did we do? We integrated with the populace that was here. Me, I go places, I hardly do anything touristy. Very, very little. I want to go meet the people that live there because then I can learn something. I want to learn about their culture. I want to learn about those people. I, I, it, I'm i horrible. I can barely speak English, so I have a hard time learning a second language. And I think that's one of the worst things that, about Americans. Yeah, Americans go everywhere and think everyone should speak English. That's horrible. I'm in the same boat, and I have a hard time, and I keep going, I need to learn another language but I can uh, recognize almost every accent in the United States. So, yeah. But going back, let, let's circle back. We both need each other. It's balance. You got to have the travelers and you got to have the stationary. Just like I can go over there. If I'm having a bad day, I can go sit with her. And that house is just calming to me. My house is just hectic and chaotic with a teenager now and myself. It's just, I don't have a whole, well, I got pictures on the wall, but I don't have 30 years of pictures. I don't have that history. I go back to my one uncle's and he has, he collects stamps from 200 years ago. You know, you, when you hold things that are 200 years old, there's history there. There, there are those roots. So it's something you can build off on. And you're, you can trace yourself back to people that built roots there. Me. I was adopted when I was very, very young. And I've made no thing about it up till, and I can even say up till just very recently, I had no biological family. So I have no roots. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, um, well, what are you? I'm an American. Hmm. Well, what part of the country? Well, I had red hair, so I probably was Irish. You, you know, Scotch or Irish, I have no roots going back. There is no history for me. I have no none of that data. Now, recently, and we'll go back to our friend Roman McClay, who, My- he, you know, talks about genes and stuff. He finally convinced me to do 23andMe and do all that. So I found out that I am a large percent um, Irish. You know, I've found more of my bloodline i've found different things and that's very interesting to me so it's like okay i've built up a little bit of history it was basically him and my boy because my boy's like well where are we from well i can tell him the whole adopted family but that's not really what he's from you know that's another one yeah so it's like okay i'll find out because you're curious and and roman's like well do you know this or know that you know it's like nope don't know I'll read Sanction. You read Sanction and, yeah, you, you think about all kinds of stuff, as you well know. So I just got to say, Roman, I'm so glad that I have gotten the chance to get to know that guy because 
I told Roman the other day, you know, we, we've connected very strongly right from the get go. And I, and I realized why the other day I said, you know, Roman, the reason I like you so much is because I could have known you at any point in my life. I could have known you when I was a total fuck up. I could have known you on the path to redemption. And I know you right now. And I'm glad to know you because you've done, you've been there and done that. And I've been there and done that. And we both kind of understand like, yeah, okay, man, you know, I, I get it. And on top of that, it's so cool that I get to know the guy who's written one of the greatest books that's ever been written. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sort of unparalleled and it's a whole, it's, it's just his thing. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it that's ever been. And you know, as much, as much credit as he wants to sort of give to Herman Melville, who, you know, look, that book was something else. Roman took that thing and made it his own and made it more. I, yes. I think made it more. And the fact that I get to know that guy on a personal level and, and talk to him, it's so cool. You know, a hundred years down the line, that three volume book that he had to break into three parts because Amazon would only let him put 800 pages <laughs> in the book. It's like, God damn, dude. <laughs> you know, that's you know what I did is I went in the mountains and I built myself a house so I could remove myself from society and write a million point two words in a year because I just I had something to say. It's like, yeah, man, that's that's. It's, He's it's so going to be laughing at us right now. Oh yeah, here you go, Roman. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right. I'm so stoked that I get to know that guy because it, it really is one of those things. And you know, in twenty years and a hundred years, they're going to look back and think, man. That guy was something else. And he was friends with this, this other wackadoo dude named Chance who did some stuff too. But he didn't write Sanction, but he did some things. And it's cool. But to, to the point you were getting at, I agree, number one, that, look, my whole thing, and I've talked politics with people and I've talked these different things, and I oftentimes get cast as being on the right or or, you know, like, a, and it's like, look, my whole thing is I'm a radical, personal sovereignty advocate. There you Responsibility, go. Responsibility, freedom. That's what I'm all about. I want the freedom to be me. I want you to have the freedom to do you. And I don't want you to mess with me. And I don't want to mess with you. I want you to do your thing. And if we have situations where my freedom and your freedom collide, I do want us to be able to work it out. Um, but if you try to take mine, I'm going to boot stomp you because I've lived the life that most people haven't lived and I survived it and you haven't mo most likely because if you had, you wouldn't be trying to step on my toes. You'd be up in the mountains writing sanction or whatever. But right. the point is, you, you know, like I, I do have these roots and you are a nomad, but I want everybody to have their space to be who they know that they should be. You know, you know, you want to travel, you want to go here, you want to go there, you want to have these experiences. And my wife is sort of in between us in that regard. She comes from a family who was able to provide a lot of opportunities for her as a child and she's been all over the world. She she played or you know, she played piano all grown up and was a competitive pianist, won competitions all over the world. She got to go to Ukraine and Ireland and all these Australia, all these places. And they went on cruises and they went to these places. And I went on hunting trips to, you know, and that was it. I went, I went camping and on hunting trips and and so you know, we had this weird sort of getting to know you thing where I never went to Disneyland till I was 25. You know, I never went on a cruise, never went to a resort. I, I, I just went camping and hunting. And now I appreciate all those things. And we still have like, it's good that we have that balance because let's say we went to the Virgin Islands on our honeymoon uh, and we went to St. Thomas and that's where we had our hotel, but we spent a lot of our time on St. John, which is just a 45 minute ferry ride. Right. And we went on these hikes and we visited these, you know, 500 year old um, places where different natives had carved stone or carved stuff into waterfalls. And it was like a sacred place for them. And then there were 400 year old sugar plantations and rum plantations that you had to hike, you know, four hours to get to. And almost nobody went there and the paths were overgrown and we learned about the culture. But then we also went to the shops and we also went and did the touristy stuff. And like you said, you don't like to do the touristy stuff. That is not my inclination. I want to know the history. I want to know the culture. I want to meet the people. I want to go to the local bars, not the tourist bars. But I also appreciate 
there's a lot of fun to be had at a tourist bar. You know, that's where the real like, oh. woo, let's, woo. And it's, absolutely. And, it's, and for me, it's exactly as you described. Uh, you know, I've always been the weird dude in any group I've been in, and and because of that, I, I often think of myself as like the fungus in the forest that connects all the different species and and helps to share resources. On my Twitter, I call myself the facilitator of excellence, and that's just because I'm not like I'm I'm chance. And there's not really anybody who's exactly like me, but I have a lot of features that are a lot like you and I could connect you with you. And, you know, and, and it's cool because now I get to, like, I'm talking with you and you're a, you're a nomad and I'm a just like Utah's the shit and I'm never leaving here unless it's to visit. But, you know, I get to know you better and then, Oh, you know what? I know Jans likes to do this and thinks this thing. And I know another guy who knows this particular thing that they can identify. And you don't be surprised if I come into your DMS on Twitter and say, Hey, I know a guy who knows a thing and I want to help connect these things. I've done that a million times now. And the point I'm getting to after having my rant here um, is that I think it's imperative that people get their minds around the idea that I can be chance and you can be Jans and Roman can be Roman and whoever can be whoever. And there's plenty of space and there's plenty of resources and there's plenty of time and opportunity for everybody to live the life that they want to, as long as we're not trying to step on each other's toes or force each other into these boxes. And you know, there's so much of that, there's so much of that going on right now and, and on both sides, frankly, but on, on one side in particular, we don't need to, I mean, we could get into that as deep as right. you want. But the point is that, when we restrict people's freedom to be who they know that they should be, that's when the conflict comes. That's when the most conflict comes and that's when the most volatility comes. And I wonder from your perspective, because we both agree that there should be room for people like you and people like me and people in between. What do you think, what do you think can be done to maybe shift the mentality away from you need to be this way or you need to be that way into uh, I'm going to be this way. You want to go down that. that rabbit hole. Okay. Before we go down that rabbit hole, I want to go <laughs> back to one more thing. Something else that, that I've always known, but until I was mature enough, I didn't understand. So we'll put it in that frame of thought. Here is how a nomad helps stationary people. At some point, I will probably make it out to Utah. Or we'll say, I will make it out to Utah. We'll shake hands. All right? There's Man. something that happens when you shake hands. I can't tell you what it is. Whatever, it's, there's some, the world changes when you shake a man's hand. You, you know he is, what he says he is. There, there's all kinds of things that go along with that. And that's a whole nother line of thought. Now, Let here, me just jump in real quick right there, okay. if you will, because I've had some bad experiences with cops, with police officers, because I, I lived a life where I would have bad experiences and I've had guns to my head and I've, I've had my place raided and shit like that. The house next to me is abandoned. It, well, the city owns it, but nobody lives there. And they, they come to like SWAT training there. And my initial response is like, oh, Okay, well, this is this is like PTSD right here, but I'm not going to let that beat me. So I go out and I introduce myself to these guys. And yesterday, to what you were saying, you know, they're out here with the with the battering tank, and they're out, you know, and doing the things like come on, blah, blah, blah. and I go out there, and I was going to do some pull ups on my tree. I have a great pull up branch on my tree. It's where I do most of my pull ups these days. And one of the guys, you know, he's in his he's in his vest and his helmet, and he's he's got his AK or what, you know, whatever. Not his AK, but you get the point. Yes. And I, and I go out there and he's like, time out. I'm on time out. And he comes up to me. You live here? Yes, I do. We're just over here training. Yeah, I know you're over here doing Hell Week, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. I recognize you guys. And cool. Well, shake hands. Boom. I give him a firm handshake. He gives me a firm handshake. And we kind of do the thing like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like you're, you're out here with a shirt off and you're doing pull-ups. And okay, you're out here with a, you know, SWAT riot gear and a helmet and an assault rifle. <laughs> next to my house cool but we shook hands we looked each other in the eyes okay man you have a good day yeah you man you have a good day too and and even for me where i've had some of these guys just really mess with my life in a big way um and i started like writing down license plates and it turns out i was being tailed for a long time <laughs> it's not paranoia if it's real but the point is right. you know i've come to the point in my life where i can shake a cop's hand and be like 
Are you just like a man? Cause I'm a man and you're a man. Cool. All right. Well, we're good. And, and so that's, I just wanted to kind of chuck that out there because even yep. when you have the history, if you're willing to move past that and they're willing to move past that, then you can meet as men. So, you know, carry on. Yep. No, it, exactly what I'm talking about. No, this goes to validation. You just talked about validation. This is what I'm going. And this is where nomads come in. And if you read it in any book, pick your books or whatever, your rangers, your nomadic types that connected different villages and people, um, RPGs, whatever, high fantasy, the whole nine yards. Let's say you've talked to someone, say you never met Fury uh, beyond Twitter. You never met him on a, uh, we never saw him on Instagram. We never saw pictures in Twitter. We never saw him on a podcast or anything else. All you did was chat with them or whatever. You never got the extra validation. But I go over and I'm traveling through the Netherlands and I end up meeting Fury. We have a good time. We sit there. We talk. So at some point, I come back through Utah. I come back and I talk to you and you'd be like, hey, I saw you mention something about meeting him. What's he like? Because you and I have validated and shook hands. Now I can validate him because I've shook hands with him. So you and him become stronger connection because there's somebody in between. And you can take that to any point in life. You know, think business. How do, you, how, how do sales guys do well? Well, they did something over here, and then they talked to this guy over here, and then there was a connection made. You know, you making connections on Twitter. A lot of guys have talked to you. They've come onto your podcast. They've talked with you. They've chatted with you. Well, Smo Joe over here or whoever, he's talked to you too, but those two guys haven't talked. What's the common connection? You are. That's right. You know, you're doing, you're doing not necessarily nomadic. You have the stationary, you're doing the podcast, but you're bringing connections together here. Whereas, okay, yes, even on a podcast, a man can fake it till he makes it. It's possible. Not very probable, but it's possible. But now, say I go meet someone. Say you were to have Craig James or Nick Lowry. I've met them on multiple times now. I'll vouch for either one of those guys. They have my back 100%. In fact, Craig is the one that saved my ass today. You know, it's I hit this roadblock. He helped me out. You know, but I've I've shook hands. I've had dinner with them. Hell, we hung out with, I don't know, how many hours when we were out in Denver, going, doing stuff. He's met my boy. He's a very powerful man. And people don't, don't always, you know, they see his message on Twitter and they hear some of the podcasts. But I got to spend a couple days with the guy hanging out, hiking the mountains in freaking Denver and everything else. I got a better connection. Freaking, it's awesome. Um, Hunter's talked about it. I mean, the Fraternity of Excellence, we're going to have our first World War meetup. We're going to have 24 men in one spot. There are going to be connections that are going to last a lifetime. What do you pay for stuff like that? You know, that that's hard to come by. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm pumped for that. But I get to shake these hands, and I get to make more connections. And then that'll just help grow. It'll strengthen everything. And that's where I think the nomads um, – come in. But at the same time, nomads get tired. They get, you know, you can only wander so long and you have to rest. Mm. You've got to have those moments of peace where you can sleep. Some of the places I've traveled and I'm planning to travel, there is no sleep. There's locking the door. There's what can I use as a weapon if I'm attacked? I'm outside my comfort zones. You know, I can go almost anywhere in the United States and I know the rules. You leave the United States, you don't know the rules. They're different. They change. And until you get to learn them and you get to know the local people and everything, you won't get to know them. And that's where those handshakings come in. It's funny to me that I go other places in other countries and I'll shake somebody's hand and they're nervous because... They're not used to Americans being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're arrogant. What's the opposite of that? 
reaching uh, humble humble okay humble you actually shake their hand you get to know them a little bit you talk to them you ask them their opinion and then not just as a like um like a noble talking to a peasant you actually sit there and you're like okay well what about this well that's how it works or you know whatever um my my one of my last trips talking about the touristy bar i hit one of those i had a blast there was people from all over the world in there and i got to talking with them i missed my bus like four times and drank way too much (laughs) (laughs) so yeah you keep missing the tourists but i took a tourist bus ended up in a bar and kept missing the bus and kept going so but i had a good time um but you can build off that. And I think that's where it goes. But that validation process, you're doing it through podcasts, which is great. It works well with the digital world that we are in. But I'm trying to go beyond that. I'm trying to meet people through Twitter. I'm trying to meet through people through the fraternity. And then I'm turning it into real world stuff. My tribe is global. And I want to meet everybody in it. That's one of my... It, it's. It's a part of my mission. It's not my mission, not my actual mission, but part of my mission is I want to meet my global tribe and and I'm getting there. So, you know, even though I want to stay here and I'll always live in Utah, um, I I still really look forward to going to these places. I, you know, I do want to travel more than I have. And it's like my, my friend, let's call him Atlas. I don't want to, he's, he's involved in a lot of things in, in Africa that I don't want to necessarily say his name. And I had a podcast with him and we talked about politics and, and power games and stuff, but I would consider him one of my very best friends and I can't wait to meet Atlas and he can't wait to meet me. You know, I, he's like, I'm going to retire in Utah because I just want to come see you because, and you know, we, we've had this relationship where we've helped each other out and enlightened each other in a lot of different ways. And I have, you know, I have a lot of guys like that all over the place and I can't wait to go to their homes and meet them and immerse myself in their culture for a while. And I can't wait to um, convince them all to move to where I live so they can bring their culture with them. And to your point, as much as I view myself as like the fungus in the forest, um, you know, people like you, you know, there's this, there's this cross-pollination process that's so essential. If, we, if I stick with sort of the, the plant metaphor for a minute, you know, let's, let's take like a aroma tomato, for example. If I just grow aroma tomatoes and I, and I save my seed of the aroma tomato and, and there's never any cross-pollination, there's never new genetics introduced, then if, if my seeds have a problem introduced, and I just keep growing those seeds, that problem gets exacerbated and perpetuated. And eventually, you know, it's going to wither away and die because it's, it's, going, it's going to all go that way. But if I have new introduction of genetics into my plant stock, then um, I can select for the ones that will be best suited to my environment. And without that cross pollination, what you get is the inbred and it could be inbred thoughts. It could be inbred people, it could be inbred food. And, and without that, ability to say okay Jans you know you've been all over the world and bring me these ideas and bring me these bits of culture and bring me these things that I wasn't aware of before bring me the handshake you you know you went and shook Fury's hand in another one you went and shook whoever's hand in in Ireland and then you came here and you shook my hand and in a very literal way when I shake your hand you know you're introducing your biome to me and I'm introducing my biome to you but also you are vouching and I meet you and I say Jans is a good dude and if he thinks another dude is a good dude, I, I don't think he's an idiot. So it's probably legitimate that the ideas that are coming and the, and the culture and the perspective that's coming, I can rely on that a lot more than just my own musings without any sort of connection. And I think that, you know, I agree with you that that is a critical thing. And I guess, I guess, man, look, I started leaning maybe towards the political thing, but I don't know how much I really want to get into that. Cause that's, that's kind okay. of, here you go. This is my thought on politics. Cause I got asked this a few weeks ago and I had to come up with it cause I am a non politic person. So this is what I've come up with. And currently, well, let's see, I got it here. This, this one's empty, but I got, I got a bottle of Irish whiskey. I finished off. Okay. 
my thought was is I was I was finishing this off, and if you want to talk politics with me, you got to buy me a bottle of Irish whiskey. <laughs> you get to talk until we're at the halfway point. Once at the halfway point, I get to give my rebuttal and tell you how much of a dummy ass you are because there's nothing you're really going to change in the whole political scheme anyways. And I'm going to make you feel like the lowest person ever. And I'm going to just give you a, all layers of shit. And then when I'm done with that, because I'll have some sympathy for you, I'll share the second half of the bottle with you. <laughs> so you know, that's... Pretty- that's if you want to talk politics with me, that's where I'm at because politics is freaking. If you're going to go do politics, become a politician. If you're not going to go do politics, just stay the hell out of it because really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's so huge and it's so big and it's so corrupted, and who knows what what means. And there's so many. If you're not a politician, why even worry about it? So it's like, I will go, I want to be me. I can take care of my circle. And I hope my circle can help other guys out. But beyond that, I'm not worried. Uh, I, I have a saying that I was taught by one of my sergeants in the military. You have to learn the rules better than everybody else, because then you can know how far to push them. It's when you can learn to bend the rules, that's when you become wealthy. When you learn to bend the rules, that's when you can progress through life. If you break the rules, you get in trouble. If you bend the rules, you're in that gray area. The only way you know that is to know the rules. So as long as you know the basic rules, you're fine. And I think that's one of the reasons why the United States, I can go just about anywhere and I know the basic rules. And I even know some of the rules beyond that. But when I travel, that's part of the thrill of the travel is I don't know the rules. Okay. There are cops that are corrupted in other countries. And not even necessarily corrupted. Let's just say they take bribes. But it's part of the culture. So is it, from an American perspective, it's corrupted. But from their perspective, it's kind of normal. You know, okay. You just pay them directly and you're done with the night. You pay them, you do this. Yeah, you did a bad thing and they're going to charge you, da-da-da. We would look at that. (laughs) Exactly. You know, you can't look through it through the American lens. Okay, these people live like this. All right, whatever. I live like this. Okay, good. You know, and and you, you have to... You have to take yourself out and look through their lens. You know, if they're rich, poor, high end, low end, whatever is going on, you have to, you have to disconnect and look through their lens. And that's very hard. And a lot of people can't do it like backpackers. They just go (laughs) through. Put it this way. Here's a reason why if, if anyone's a backpacker out there, yeah, whatever, clean up after yourself. I'm walking on a freaking beach on the another hemisphere on the other side of the world and I'm walking and I look over and I see these other guys walking toward me and they're backpackers and I'm looking at them and they look like hell. You know, they're not clean. They're dirty. And I get it. I hike and everything, but I can't say they dropped the garbage, but when I walked down the beach, I found some. Did they drop it? I don't know. But if you're a nature lover, you didn't pick it up. Yeah. Um, Go wash yourself. You know, you come back into society, go find a shower and take a bath. Sit next to a backpacker on a plane that hasn't washed in a week. Holy crap. Yeah, hard pass. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, and it's just the basic stuff. It's like, no. And... Yeah, I just, and I'm sure there's a bunch of good ones out there, but at the same, it's just like anything, you know, it's like, well, I'm such and such and I'm from whatever country. And I will say Americans are the worst at that. Well, I'm an American. So it's not, you're not in America. (laughs) And it's like, yeah. Uh, 
accept him, you know, work through, you're traveling, take your time. But it's like, leave no trace. When you're walking through the woods, leave no trace behind you. Don't drop garbage, fix things behind you, leave it better than what it was before. I don't know how I got off to that rant. Bring us back, Chance, because I got, I, I went sidetracked there. <laughs> sure, you know, something you said triggered a memory in me. Um, you know, you said that wherever you go, the rules change. And a lot of that comes down to accepting things for what are rather than the way that you wish they would be or that you think they should be. And I, I have a really good example of that. And it, it takes me back to my honeymoon again in the Virgin Islands. I had dreadlocks at the time, you know, and uh, you I had was, dreadlocks? Like yeah, serious long dreadlocks? They're about this long. I started when my hair was this long, and then I grew them for like four or five years, and they were they were good. Nice. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> okay. I'm for impressed. What it's worth, for what it's worth, they they were pretty good dreadlocks. But and I was yoked at the time, you know. I was powerlifting, and I was strong and buff and stuff. But I had these dreadlocks, and we were at this. You know, we were on St. Thomas, and I was looking for some weed. I wanted some weed. And the first night we were there, this guy was just walking down the street, drunk as hell. He's like, give me 20 bucks. You could take a handful out of this garbage bag. He literally had this like 50 gallon garbage bag full of weed. And I was like, is this good? He's like a little bit less. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I ran, and it was kind of dirt weed, you know, and I ran out of that pretty quick. Cause we, you know, I was rolling joints left and right. Cause I, I had and my hotel was right on the beach and keep in mind, this is all allegedly. I, allegedly. Never, yes. All the drugs I've ever taken have only been allegedly, but, I was looking for some more weed and I, and I, I made good friends with the bartender at our hotel, one of the bartenders. That's the like, best hey, thing I'm, to do. Oh yeah, exactly. I was like, <laughs> we're going to get some weed. He's like, well, you might want to try Cokie beach. Okay. Where's Cokie beach? Well, I'll just ask the cabs. Okay. And I go out there and I go, they had this Airstream trailer that had been converted into a bar and it was this Rasta lady. And I go up and I buy a couple of beers. I'm like, Hey, by the way, you know where I can find a little, like, you know, she's like, I never, <laughs> I never smoked none of that shit in my life. My daughter smokes the weed and she's stupid. And I was thinking, I'm like, whatever, lady. You know, but that's fine. Um, but do you know where I could find any? And she's like, talk to those boys right there. And they were literally just standing right next to her bar. Okay. <laughs> so I go up to her. I'm like, hey, the bartender told me I could find some weed from you guys. And they just like, literally like mean mugging, like t-shirt mean mugging, you know, just like, Whoa. I was like, so, so no weed then? You know, and, and, and one of the guys, just a straight up like dreadlocks down to here, dreadlock Rasta, he's like, wrong place, wrong time, white boy. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. Uh, but if you change your mind, I'm going to go down to the beach. And I went down there and we had some drinks. And this, this tan dude, a white guy, but so tan, you know, just like hardly appeared to be a Caucasian dude. He comes up and I thought he had an Irish accent for a second. But he was from Maine, and he came out there to do some work, and his, his accent had kind of morphed or whatever, but he'd stayed there for like seven years. He just never went home. And he's like, hey, you know, I heard you were looking for some, some weed, and I was like, yeah, I am. And he's like, well, let me go see what I can do about that. Okay, man. And then he comes back. He's like, look, I, I made a word. They'll probably come down here and talk to you and whatever. Okay, and I waited there for like two hours, and nobody did nothing. So I was like, okay, let's go because it's getting sundown and kind of got some hostile vibes from people. So I went and had the bartender lady call me a cab. Um, and then after I called the cab, that same dreadlock Rasta comes around the back of the Airstream bar and he's like, psst, psst. <laughs> me? Okay. <laughs> and, and my wife was like, are you sure? I was like, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> so I, I went back behind this Airstream trailer and he holds out these five little Ziploc bags of, of weed. And he's like, I was like, how much, man? You know, I just kind of keep my voice down because he wouldn't say anything. I was like, I only brought 60 bucks with me. He just takes two of the bags, just three of them sitting there. Okay, 60 bucks, gives me the weed. He takes off, all of his friends leave. They go wherever they go. The cab shows up two minutes later and I get out of there. And the, the point I'm getting at here is that, you know, if I would have been at home, I could have just called up a person and said, hey man, I need a bag. And he'd be like, cool, come over. 
and I would have gone over and gotten my weed and come back. But you know, there I had to introduce myself to the bartender and then she had to kick me over to these guys. And then they had to vet me through the white boy who had stayed there for seven years and was the kind of the go between. And then I had to go call the cab to go home. So they didn't have me hanging around for a long time. And then, you know, he disappeared after I, so, and I, and I never knew the name and I barely talked to him. And it turns out that the DEA had come through that area and had raided the place and caused a bunch of turmoil for these guys. And so they were super skittish at the time. And would I have liked to just been able to say, Hey man, can I get some weed for my vacation here? Cause I'm on my honeymoon. And they would have just like brought it to my hotel room or I could have just gone to a place and gotten it, but I had to go through all these steps and you know, and it is what it is. Like maybe drug culture is not an example that everybody identifies with, but the, the point to just tie it back to what you said is those were the rules. That's the way I had to play the game. And I could have gotten all butt hurt. I could have acted like an asshole. I could have stormed out of them and be like, fine, I know you got weed, but you know, if I have to just do it, cause I'm an American, but you know, I just like, okay, well it is what it is. I'm going to play the game. And then I got what I wanted and I woke up the next day and I rolled a big fat joint and I went out and sat on the balcony and listened to the way. Allegedly. Story. Yeah. Allegedly. Alleg allegedly. And my vacation would it not have been the vacation that I planned on if I hadn't been willing to play the rules of the game the way that right. they actually were as opposed to how I wanted them to be. And there's a lot of other examples out there. But, yeah. and maybe, boy, that, that was sort of a rant and everything. <laughs> no, it was a good one, though. It, it proves that point. You know, in how many, how many Americans haven't even been out of their town? How many have not even left their city? How many, how many know the rules of Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Phoenix, L.A.? You know, we, they're all major. They all have different rules. You know, you come to my neck of the woods, and I know the rules. I know them forwards and backwards. I know what you can get away with. Do I know what I can get away with in Utah? Nah. I have a basic understanding, but I don't know what I can get away with. You know, it's, it's as simple as I know in my state how fast I can drive before I'll get pulled over. You know, it's, it's simple little stuff like that. And it's like, okay, um, one of the places I'm traveling, if people were one-on-one, -on -one, I had no worries. I finally figured out if they're in groups, I need to walk across the street. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. It's situational awareness. It's being aware of your surroundings. And this goes back to being a good nomads. I'll even give it to the backpackers on this one. Well, some of them anyway. Um, you have to know what's going on around you to survive. If you're oblivious to it, you're going to just get slaughtered and, and shoved under and the papers aren't even going to report it. You know, and yeah, you might live in a city of, you know, 3 million people, but there's people that have never left their block. To them traveling, you know, across town to whatever, you know, some monument or something was huge. Whereas, and it took them three hours to get there because they had to take the trams that were slow to get there. Whereas me, I travel 45 minutes and cross two states, or, well, three hours and cross two states, I should say. You know, and, and we, we have the different stuff. I've seen almost every major thing that there is to see in the United States. Not that many guys my age can say that. And I could say that when I was quite young. I could say that in my 20s that I'd seen a lot. Yeah, it's different perspectives. So and one of those things is, but when I'm in the mood to tell a story, I can tell some stories, hmm. you know, some depending on the crowd, I'll embellish, you know, if they're young or kids or whatever, and you make it more fun. And that's where the stories become. There's this kernel of truth through it and it stays there. And then you add the little extras in there to make it more fun, but I can make a story technical, you know, I went here, did this, blah, blah, blah. But that gets boring and you won't remember that. Even tonight, we're talking in story form. Why? Because it'll resonate with people. You know, if we were textbook, everybody would already log off. Well, whenever you post this, they'll already have logged off. You have to be engaging in what you do and how you converse. 
be it on Twitter, on a podcast, on anything. You, if you're not engaging, people don't want to listen. And then they won't learn things. They won't learn the moral of the story. They won't learn about the different roles that go on. And, and that is something that is talked about by a lot of the, I don't want to say leaders. That's not the uh, um, leader, organizer, personas. No, that is it. I'm trying to even think like along Ed, Ed Lattimore or some of the, you portray, what am I looking for? They call them influencers, as distasteful as that influence. word. Influencer. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to avoid that, but yes. Even influencers, you know, we lost the disconnect. The families have broken apart, and you don't sit around listening to the older men. I was lucky. I had my grandfathers and uncles talking and teaching me stuff. You know, it's just like they, and I'll even bring it up. They talk about all these pills on Twitter and freaking Manosphere and everything. The problem is, is they're so freaking watered down that they're freaking useless and they're stupid. Do away with them. Because no one, everybody has their version of it. You know, have confidence, have strength, have leadership. Give me words that have meaning that go back 10,000 years and I'll start listening to you. That's, yeah, screw all this modern whatever. It's just marketing and blah, blah, blah. That stuff annoys me. Um, but you have to get into the meat of things. It's like, you know, the question, well, when did you find the red pill? Easy. When my grandfather took me by in the woodshed and started to teach me how to fight. <laughs> how old were you? Ten. You know, someone beat me up when I was little, and he's like, that's not going to happen again. Well, what are we going to do? I'm going to knock you down until you learn to stand up and defend yourself. That was at 10. You know, there was no pills or whatever. It's I'm going to build confidence and make you strong. And that's how my grandfathers and uncles, you know, that guided me. My father guided me. You know, here is how you do things. My father was a salesman. I have avoided sales for... I don't know, 45 years. Let's just add my entire life in. <laughs> I've avoided it. What am I going to do in my next step of the life? I'm becoming a salesman. You know, it's like, okay, it took me this long to realize he was right. Hmm. And kids do that, you know. Man. My dad's passed and moved on. He's in a better place. And I'm still going, well, the old man was right. Damn it. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> but there, and then it's how much energy do you put behind it? Everyone sells. If they like it or not, you're doing sales. You know, you're selling yourself. You sell yourself every day one way or the other. And you're working through it, and there's different levels of it. You sell items or you sell yourself. You sell a service. There's something in your day-in, day-out interactions. And that takes confidence. That takes, you know, let's use words that have power and meaning and everything else, and you build on that instead of using all the malarkey. There we go. We'll, we'll beat up Twitter a little bit and all their malarkey. No, what's the word you've been using? Malarkey-arkey. Yes! I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It's fun to use that. <laughs> yes. It's very, you're using it well. I, I like, I've been using it. You know, that word has been very useful to me because I see something that I want to f argue with or fight with. And I just drop in malarkey, Arky, and it says enough. And then I can just walk away from it. Like, oh, you have this stupid political position. You're trying to take away people's freedoms with your bullshit. Malarkey, Arky. Okay, I'm done. You know what it means. I know what it means. Anybody who reads it knows what it means. It means you're being um, like you're a foolish ass, and, and, and we're good. That's, that's all I was really trying to get at anyway, and now I don't have to have a back and forth with you. And you know what? I've, I haven't had anybody that I've dropped that on try to, try to like, come back with it. it they just... It is what it is, and they can realize it. So, look, man, we're closing in on two hours here. Um, and I, I have to say, it's very easy to talk to you. You know, it's – there's a thing that happens when you run into a person who – you know, like, especially for men who are interested in being men, you run into a guy and you're like, okay, you know, you've had some things, you've done some stuff, but, you you know, you like guns and you do, you do stuff outdoors and you're, you're into – 
personal character strength and physical strength and doing the things and maybe you had to learn that but you're here and I get you and you get me and so the conversations flowed very easily um, but I do think it's probably a good time to start moving towards the end of the podcast all right and so you know we've talked about a lot of stuff here we've we've kind of gone from gaming and, and the analogs to Twitter and and how you know upbringing and different roots and nomads and all, and all these things and let's say that let's say that somebody's you know we've had this conversation but people listen to it and let's say that one of the listeners is sitting in front of you whoever it is in your head whoever you imagine it to be and they say you know Jans I really like what you had to say and I identify with a lot of things you talked about uh, you know I feel like I want to move through this world and I want to be one of the people who can bring that validation I want to go shake Fury's hand and then bring him to Chance in Utah. And I want to be one of those people, but, you know, I'm not exactly sure how to make sure that I keep true to myself in the process. And I'm not exactly sure how I want to make sure that I'm, you know, sort of treating the places that I go to with respect and making sure that I'm not the backpacker dumping shit on the beach or whatever. And I really want to make a positive impact in the places that I go and be able to collect these things in me and share them with the people that I get to meet along the way. If that person was sitting in front of you right now and they said, Jans, how can, you know, you've, you've done this and you've lived a life and I look up to you in a lot of ways. And how can I make sure that I'm being that guy who's respectful and receptive and aware and able to, have the kind of self-respect and the respect for other people that makes it so that I can move through these places and be that transmitter of knowledge and of character and of validation without stepping on too many toes and causing too many problems along the way. What would you tell that person? The first thing is don't be a dumbass. <laughs> Followed up with, and, and there's a reason I say that is you need to find a mentor. And sometimes it's not the person you think it is. It's the person you need, or it's not the person you want. It's the person you need. And I got lucky. I got a mentor. Um, I actually got to see him the other day. I was up visiting with him. You, you got to have that person that's been there before you. And like we kind of talked, teach you the rules of how to be respectful, how to do this. No, they may have not traveled to Tanzania or whatever, but there's a certain rule to when you travel. It doesn't matter where you go, pick a country. What is it? We're at like 197 countries in the world. If they've been someplace, they've been around, they've done things, you go talk with them. You go eat dinner with them. And you sit and you listen to them. And there's the key point. You got to keep your mouth and not just hear them. You have to listen to them. And in that, they will exchange the information and they'll teach you the rules of how to make it through. If it wasn't for my mentor, I would be a dumbass American. Plain and simple. You know, he had been places to, before I was even born. You know, he taught me those kind of things, how to be respectful. And at the same token, how to be a badass when you needed to be, you know, when to talk a person down, when to stand your ground. And you have to know both sides. Sometimes charisma wins. Sometimes, not peacocking's not the right word. Sometimes you just got to rear up and have a spine and be ready to kick somebody's ass. Exactly. And if you want to learn how to do something, you got to find someone that's been down that path before. Because if you're trying to learn it on your own, you're going to stumble and fail something miserably. And that's what ends up getting you hurt, killed. You know, the worst of the worst is going to happen to you. But when you have an older mentor that can kind of guide you along and give you some tips, you go do your first traveling, even if it's just within your own country or whatever, you learn that respect factor. And there's the key. You got to know someone like anything that's been already down that path. That would be my main thing is to go find that person. Now we're, we're flipping things here and I have a question for you. Sure. 
this was, I don't know, you'll probably know the date or whatever. You went and wiped out all of your tweets a few months back. You clean slated them. And I was bummed because it was like, what, a Friday night? It was like around a weekend, I think. But you tweeted this out in the evening or something similar to. And when I woke up in the morning, all your tweets were gone because I was going to screenshot it. But it, <laughs> Yeah, that's how, how I was like, I was tired. And I went, oh, cool. I like that one. But then you did it and I go, so since I got you, you made some comment to me along the lines of, you are the, the most loyal person I know on Twitter. And I wanted to know what you were thinking about on that. Well, if you remember it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I kind of mentioned that in the introduction that I appreciate your loyalty and there's a lot of weirdness on Twitter and there's this, there's this realm that, that, you know, you and I kind of inhabit and there's business guys and there's self-improvement guys. And there's just like, there's the badass guys and the, and the trades guys and stuff. But you know, it's, it's all people who either do stuff or want to facilitate other people to be able to do better stuff. And then there's the kind of like the shitheads who come in and when, you know, you've, you've staked your claim and said, these are my dudes. And if you come against my dudes, I'm against you now because I know Roman's a good dude. You know, I know Hunter's a good dude. I know these people are good men because like you said, I've, sh you know, I've had a handshake with them and I know they have my back and I know that I have theirs. And because of that, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. It's just the idea that like, if you have a friend in real life and, and you're tight with them and you know their secrets and they know yours and you would never betray each other for a million dollars or for a woman or whatever, people forget that that exists on the internet a lot. And I, you know, I came to the internet after being who I am and being ready to emerge onto the internet. I wasn't coming to look for who I was. I was coming to share who I was. And then I found some people and I feel the same way about the people who I know are my amigos and my allies and my brothers. You know, if you want to, if you want to mess with them, fuck you. I mean, you're my enemy now. And I've seen that in you, you know, somebody comes against, you know, whoever Roman or, or Hunter or these collections of this collection of people, who you have identified with and made friends with, there's no shit that you're going to take and you're always going to have their back and you're always going to stand up with them. And that's what I was getting at. It's just, there are not very many people like that on Twitter or on the internet. That's, in that's what I was wondering. If you found many lacking in that area. Big time. It's, it, it's fickle. And you know, I've always tried to, it's not as though I was unaware of the internet and, and what went on it. I mean, I didn't know the finesse and the, and the actual engagement because I hadn't, but I, you know, I, I know what goes on on the internet. I see the attacks and I see the mobs and I see all this stuff. And I knew coming into the internet, okay, if I try to fake the funk, you know, if I try to be disingenuous, I might get away with it for a while, but somebody's going to sniff me out and then they're going to expose who I am. And then I'm going to have to either lie or run away or, or whatever. So right when I came to the internet, you know, I, I wrote about who I was. I wrote about my dark history and the problems with drugs and with addiction to porn and all this kind of stuff. And I wrote blog, guest blog articles, and I did podcasts with people where I just shared all this shit about me. And now all my stuff is out there. You can't dox me. I've already doxed myself, and I have exactly. that. Found. You, can't, you can't hurt me. All the stuff's out there. All that stuff about me is out there. And it's not, is it comfortable? Of course it isn't comfortable. I, you know, like, that's, that's why people can get away with that in the first place because you're, you don't want to, people to know that about you because you want them to think you're a certain way. And I thought, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. If I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming and I'm being chance and I'm being genuine. But most people haven't, don't have that philosophy or haven't made the steps to be able to be ready to do that. And that's fine. I, you know, do what you're going to do. But the people, there's a lot of people out there who are playing that game. It's a clout game and it's a look at my special life game. And it's a, I'm so awesome at this thing or that thing. And it's like, well, no, you're not dude. Because yeah. if you were, then I know the people who are really like that. Cause I lived my whole life in real life and I've met them and you're not like them. You're lying. Right. 
and, and if you're going to come against me, you're going to come against the people who I have validated and verified are who they say they are or are like they say they are, then we're not going to get along. You know, like some of these gotcha guys, or, you know, these anonymous yeah. guys who come in like, oh, well, you know, like, look, I joined the liminal order with Jack Murphy. Jack's right. a good dude. Do I agree with all of the things he's done in his past? No, of course I don't. I don't right. agree with all the things that I've done in my own past, but I can tell Jack's a good dude. And I've talked with him, you know, talked to them behind the scenes and the people who have joined that, you know, most of the guys are like in their thirties or forties or fifties and they all make a hundred thousand dollars a year and are college graduates or whatever. And I talk with these guys and they're good dudes. And so when some dipshit with, with an anonymous account, who's clearly 19 and has no social skills and clearly has no <laughs> experience because they're not offering anything. They're just attacking people, tries to take down Jack Murphy or tries to, you know, take down, one of my friends like Garrett from the ion or any of these people, right. like, Dude, people like me, people like you, people who have lived real lives and, and know what they're talking about. We can see right through you. We don't have to see your face. We don't have to know your name. We know what kind of person you are. We know what kind of game you're playing. And that's not going to work out for you real well. If we're being honest, you might convince some of these other pimply 19 year olds who've never lived a life that, you know, so-and-so is not a good dude, but, we know the game. Real men know what real men are like, and you're not it, bro. And that's, right. and it's, you know, it's not just guys, but I don't have a lot to do with women on the internet because I don't think it's appropriate for me as a man who's married and is very committed to my marriage and my wife to be having a lot of relationships with women online. And I have found some people who, um, you know, like there's some women online that I can have some sort of relationship, but even then I, I keep my distance. I don't do, yep. no, I don't do like- Occasional comment. A joke, a laugh. Like connections on the DMs or anything like that. And if right. they come on my podcast, you know, we have a conversation, but then it's not, we don't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or relationship because it's not appropriate. Right. And and that's my view and you can disagree with me, but I'm, yeah. I've been married. No, for I think that's a good view. So, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> a mature view. That's one yeah. of the things that gets talked about. That's, that's evolving. And I can actually the one of one of the good points there in, in I know you is uh Prometheus. His wife will come on my timeline or I'll see stuff, I follow her and everything, and we'll kid a little bit, but they're still online there. It's still yeah. the internet, and that's where people cross. Um him and I can go at it toe to toe. You know, we have fun way more than we should. But <laughs> at the same time, you know, there's certain lines you just don't cross. And you don't go there. And you, you can have some fun. But, yeah, beyond that, you're absolutely right. You don't build that stuff up. You know, it's, okay, what would you do? Well, if you go after her, though, eh, I may come after you. You know, it's one of those things. It's it's that whole respect factor. So, but, yeah, I think you're nailed on. You're, you're right on on that one. It's more people need to look at it that way. There's a couple of accounts that I actually unfollowed. Because it's like, okay, you're just, yeah, you may have a decent message or you're good, saying good stuff, but I don't want to deal with you. You know, you're going down this path and it's like, yeah. So they wander across my line and I'll read and I'll start to type. How often do you type something? Delete it and go, no, you know, that that's that's the maturity factor kicking in when you don't just run your mouth all the time. You're like, da da da. No, nah, that's bad news. <laughs> yeah, and look, you know, people, I want people to live their lives, but, you know, like, for example, these game guys, these pickup artist guys, these red pill guys, these, it's like, look, dude, I've been married for 11 years and I have three kids and I lift weights and I write books and I make communities and I have a podcast and, and I write blogs and I, and I write political journalism now and I do stuff. I'm a real man doing real things. I, I don't need your pickup artist bullshit. And if, and if some young guy can gain a little bit of self-confidence and learn about body language and learn about, you know, relationship dynamics from you. Cool. But you're not my hero, man. And, and you never would have been because to be frank, I value my relationship with my wife as a sacred bond. And I truly believe that we were made to be together. I, so when, when I look at the world through that lens, 
and I look at these guys who um, sort of talk shit on that deep connection or, or, you know, like being a husband being a good husband and, and making sure that you're working within that relationship and the rules within that relationship to make sure that it works and that you're a good husband and a good father. There's a difference between being a bitch and being a good husband for sure. You shouldn't be a bitch. You should be a strong man who's a leader, but you should also understand that your wife is a person. She has needs, she has desires, and you need to allow for those in your life. And to be honest, I haven't always been the best at that. Um, but I'm learning and growing, you know, every day, uh, you know, I'm 33 years old and every day I feel like I learn more about myself and about my wife and about how we interact with each other. And it's, and it's an ongoing process and I would not be the man I am today. I would not have accomplished the things that I've done in my life had it not been for the relationship I have with her because it's revealed to me a lot of the weak points that I have, just like it has for her. And we have supported each other and encouraged each other. And sometimes like, hey, you're doing this wrong. It's wrong what you're doing. You need to fix this. Because sometimes the hints and the like, well, you're, you know, like, hey, it doesn't work. Every once in a while, you need a punch to the head, you know? And, yep. And, oh, good. And I mean, figuratively, but the point is, like, I couldn't have been the person I am today, and I, and I wouldn't have chosen to be the person I am today had it not been for that relationship. So when I look at these guys, it's like, well, look, man, if you're happy and you're satisfied in that life, fine. But if you try to talk shit on my life, well, it's like, what have you done? You've traveled all over and gotten laid and gotten drunk? Well, I mean, if that's, if that's what you want, then that's cool. But I find a lot more meaning in this other stuff because I did all that when I was young and I don't want to ever do that again because I was depressed and I wanted to blow my brains out, to be frank. Right. Um, so, I mean, I'm kind of rambling on about that shit. So, look. No. Well, here, I, I want to add one more thing to this because this is something I, I say to young guys and even older guys and everyone that's bought into the whole Manosphere part thing. All game is... And we'll, we'll throw it out on here. All game is, is confidence remarketed. That's it. If anyone's listening to this, to this whole podcast, if you've made it this far, realize <laughs> that you cannot sell confidence. You can't. So, but you can sell game. Game sounds cool. It sounds edgy and people will sell you game every day. But really what it comes down to is confidence. Use the real word. That's what it is. Is they're they remarketed confidence, and that's what they're selling you. And you don't even have to pay for that. It's given away for free. Uh, the tools are out there. You just got to open your eyes and go after it. But that's I think one of the craziest things when guys ask me about, well, what does game mean to you? And I'm like, nothing. Because game is just confidence. And with a touch of charisma. One of the other guys I was talking to, he's like, well, does charisma play into it? Yes, charisma does. But you don't even have to necessarily have charisma, but you do have to have confidence. If you push through it, there it is. It's probably what? 80%? We'll, we'll go 80-20 rule. If you talk to me anytime, I love the 80-20 rule. It's 80% uh, 80 confidence, 20% charisma. And you can work and learn both of those. So. That's my thought to all of them. Look, I, I, have a, I have a section in my book, Uncommon Mentality, where I kind of talk about this. I don't, you know, but it's called Be Undeniable. And I, and I talk about body language and I talk about these different tools that you can use to present yourself as confident. But what I also make sure to emphasize is confidence is earned through being something worth being. You know, if you like look you can learn body language and you can learn speech cadence and you can learn to match your breathing and you can learn the tricks of eye contact and when should i touch the shoulder and all this stuff cool but if you had done something in your life that you were proud of and you would remove the stuff out of your life that you weren't proud of and you could walk into a room and know i can stand up straight and i can feel good about myself and i can meet the eyes of any motherfucker in here because i know that i've done what i need to be to be the person that i want to be all that stuff comes naturally all this, all these tools and, and all these tricks and all these patterns and rhythms, those are just copying the people who actually earned those mannerisms by being who they knew they should be. And 
you might miss one or two or three of those things, even if you've done those things, then you go, oh, okay, you know, this is kind of like if I learn body language or I learn the, you know, facial expressions or I learn uh, emotional responses. That was a piece I was missing, but I had all the rest. But you can't get everything without having right. done something worth doing. And so I agree with you totally. You know, if you walk into a room, it, like if I walk into a room, you're going to know I'm there. Everybody's going to know I'm there because I'm, I'm kind of a wacky dude, but I'm also competitive and I'm also um, just undeniable. It's chance right. and chance is there. And you might not like me, you might not agree with me, but you're gonna know my opinion and you're gonna know that I'm there. And if you're not like that, you can emulate some of the things that I do, but it's not gonna be genuine and people are gonna sniff you out if they're actually those kind of people like we talked about. So I guess, look, exactly like you said, it's confidence. And where does confidence come? Confidence comes from doing something worth being proud of. And I suppose that's sort of my final message to the people who are, have made it through this tour de force is look, you can play all the tricks and games in the world that you want in your relationships, in your work, in, uh, you know, whatever. But when push comes to shove, the people who have actually done the things that they knew that they should do and are confident in themselves because they don't act against their own principles and they try hard at the stuff that they know is worth doing. Those are always going to be the people who win out in the long run and usually in the immediacy too, because they have the skills and experience to win out over your fake ass. So if you don't want to be the guy who gets stomped underfoot by the guys who are actually doing something, then ask the guy who's doing something, What's the next step? Find a mentor, learn what they have to offer and implement it. Don't just pretend, do it. And when you do that, you will level up and then the whole, the whole world will look different. And once it does, you're good to go. And I, and I suppose, look, man, I think we've, I think we've dropped a lot of stuff on these people and I, and I'm really grateful that you took the time to come on here and, and share this time with me. Um, and I think people could get a lot from you, not just here, but you know, on Twitter. And where, so why don't you tell the people where they can find you? Why don't you say hello to anybody that you'd like to say, and, and we can, we can close this thing out. All right. Uh, Twitter at steel Jans. That's where I'm at. And then I've, uh, my blog's been around for a while now, but I've been ramping it up. Uh, what am I at? About a month now. And that's uh, at barbaric rhetoric uh, rhetoric. There we go. I'm, I'm listening to Hunter here. Barbarian Rhetoric at uh, dot com. And a lot of my thoughts, a lot of my ideas. Um, I have a couple other writers that are coming on and helping with it. So it's not just me talking. I'm getting different influencers. Uh, the other thing is, and uh, who's coming on? Uh, Free Matt's coming on tomorrow. I'm getting... Um, my Fridays, I'm trying to, or I actually went out today. This is Friday night. Uh, I'm getting guest writers to come on because I want other people's viewpoints on it. I, I don't want just my thoughts on it. So I'm pushing that and I'm working on that. So there's my blog that I'm, I, it's going, it's growing. Um, and th those are the two, two main spots. And then I'm at, I don't know, I'm on IG, Steel Jans again. And I, I post some stuff on there. I play around with that. That that's more of a hobby. Well, very good. Um, and I'll I'll make sure to include links to your stuff in the show notes and everything. Um, so look, is there any parting thoughts or anything you want to say? I don't know. We we went over a lot. If we start anything now, we'll go down another rabbit hole. So we'll yeah, we'll leave everybody's there. If they made it this far and actually listened to us, good on you. <laughs> Hey, and look, man, like I said, it was easy to talk to you. Um, let's do this again sometime down the road. Let's All give right. people a break from the ear beating we gave them tonight, and then we'll try it again. Um, so, look, this has been the Logos and Trivical Podcast. I've been Chance Lunsford. He's been Steel Jans, and we are both out of here. <laughs>